This is TTT Live. I'm DK Rostar. The Ministry of Health is giving an update on the status of COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago. We're bringing you live coverage on TTT, Talk City 91.1 FM, Next 99.1 FM, and on Facebook at TTT Live Online. We go now to the Manager of Corporate Communications at the Ministry of Health, Candice Alcantara. Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you for joining us for another virtual media conference, which allows us at the Ministry of Health to provide you with an update on the national COVID-19 response. I am pleased to advise that this morning, we will be joined virtually by Dr. The Honorable Keith Rowley, Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. Here in studio, we have the Honorable Terence Dayal Singh, Minister of Health, Dr. Roshan Parishram, Chief Medical Officer, and Dr. Don Martin, Medical Chief of Staff at the Coover Hospital and Multi-Training Facility. We begin with the opening statement from the Honorable Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Candice. Good morning to the Honorable Prime Minister. He will be joining us soon. Good morning to the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Martin. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the media, a very good Monday morning to you and all persons listening and viewing. Uh, today, Monday the 22nd, I believe, of mm -hmm. February, I always get dates wrong, Monday the 22nd of um, February, I'm here to report about the successful launch of our COVID-19 vaccination program. It has been a very successful launch where we started, as we have always said, with those um, high exposure, high risk persons who happen to be healthcare workers. To date, the latest figure I have is that we have vaccinated 440 healthcare workers. That's a pretty good number. So, out of the 2,000 um, doses, um, each person has to get two. It means that the initial batch of vaccines can vaccinate 1,000 persons. So, we have done 440. So basically, we are 44% there after just four days, remembering that we started on um, Wednesday the 17th. The numbers so far are under the Tobago uh, Regional Health Authority. They did 34 on Saturday. North Central Regional Health Authority, they have done 293. And Southwest started on Friday. They have done 113. That gives you a total of 440. And as I said, that's only after four, four days. What we are doing now, and all the RHAs have started their internal campaigns. We had an external stakeholder meeting with the University of the West Indies a couple of weeks ago, Sundays ago, targeted mainly to healthcare workers. And I want to thank the University of the West Indies for being a co-partner. So all RHAs have started their internal campaigns with their healthcare workers so we can move to the target of having 1,000 healthcare workers vaccinated in the shortest possible space of time. And CRHA, because they manage three of the COVID facilities, they had their internal symposium yesterday with healthcare workers, remembering that they manage Cora, Coover, and um, Cora, Coover, Arima. and Arima. ERHA begins their internal campaign today. So all RHAs are engaging the internal staff to really, really ramp up this issue of vaccine acceptance. And we are quite pleased with the numbers so far. So that's my very short report on the vaccination program thus far and um, we'll be available to answer all of your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. And I welcome Dr. Roshan Parishram to deliver his presentation. He will present the clinical update and also give some further insight into the COVID-19 vaccine rollout plans. Hi, good morning, Honorable Minister. Um, Dr. Martin, members of the media, members of the viewing and listening public, so I'll give the brief clinical update first, and then we'll go into our presentation. So as of yesterday, at both public and private facilities, we had tested 93,578 persons. Over the last 24 hours, we, we had four positives. 
It begins a total of 7,680 persons since the 12th of March testing positive. Of those, 4, 7,403 have recovered, leaving a total active caseload of 138. Our deaths now stand at 139, and we have 12 patients in hospital. Our step-down facility has two persons, our quarantine sites 303, and in home isolation 120. Just to say where those 12 persons are in hospital, they're all at the Coover Hospital and multi-training facility. Two of those are in ICU at this time. With regards to our step-down, both of them are at the UE Davy facility. Right, so if I can have my first slide, I'll go straight into the presentation. And the presentation, just to give you, will be focusing on the preparedness to receive and distribute the COVID-19 vaccine, our plan for Trinidad and Tobago. Next slide. We could go again, forward. So just to give a little background again, the Ministry of Health has taken a three-pronged approach to securing the COVID-19 vaccines. The COVAX facility, which is co-led by WHO, Gavi and CEPI, agreement signed on September 18, 2020, and a down payment of 10 million TT was paid thereafter. On January 30, TNT was allocated an initial 100, 100 to 120,000 doses of the AstraZeneca vi vi vaccine via the COVAX facility and should be delivered in the coming weeks. Second, the bilateral discussions with vaccine suppliers have begun since October 1st, 2020, including Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Sinopharm, Moderna, and Sanofi. Thirdly, the use of the CARICOM initiative where Trinidad and Tobago is registered as a purchaser of vaccines via the uh, African Medicine Council. Next slide. So in the pre-planning phase of vaccine arrival, and this, this is goes for COVID as well as other vaccines that we have gotten in the past, an official request is received or sent to PAHO for vaccines via the office of the CMO. MOH then accepts a price estimate and provides evidence of payment to PAHO, usually via wire transfer at that point in time. Pre-alert and shipping documents and ETAs and broker engagement occurs thereafter. And in purple at the end, manufacturer, our manufacture occurs at the plant, distribution, dispatch, vaccines to country, and consigned. Our consignee in Trinidad is generally the NIPDEC C40. There's a consignee in that department. Next slide. So once the vaccines arrive, they come usually by air freight. They will go to the airports on the south side. Tomorrow we have a planned drill with all the stakeholders to look at our vaccine arrival process that we have used over the years to ensure that there are no um, there are no kinks in the process. So that is happening at 11:30 and at the airport tomorrow. So it begins with vaccine arriving at the Perco International Airport. It has to be consigned to the broker and stored appropriately during that period of time to ensure that the cold chain is maintained. Depending on the vaccine we get, we will look at the type of storage we need at that point in time. The broker will be alerted and immediately, 24 hours a day, they will um, do the necessary arrangements by way of documentation to get the vaccine cleared. And then delivery occurs to the central storage. Next slide. Just to focus a little bit on the Oxford AstraZeneca storage. And this is a vaccine that has been proven to be safe and effective and again stored at 2 to 8 degrees Celsius. It's delivered in two doses. New advice from WHO in terms of their interim advice says that it's recommended anywhere between the second dose, 8 to 12 weeks after the initial dose. And the initial allocation again provides that 50, at least 50,000 persons can be vaccinated in the first go if we get the 100 to 120,000 doses of this vaccine. Next slide. So the MOH has identified the following sites for vaccine storage, 2 to 8. So NIPDEC at C40 with a capacity of 120,000 doses. Arima General Hospital with a capacity of 120,000 doses. Point Fortin Hospital with a capacity of 100,000 doses. The County Medical Officer of Health with a capacity of 50,000 doses, and that's in Tobago. Hoover Hospital and Multi-Training Facility with a chiller that is under construction to house 400,000 doses approximately. Next slide. So the vaccination storage plan, again, the facilities have the capacity to store substantial quantities of doses for other types of vaccines. For example, if we do get the, the Moderna vaccine, which requires storage at minus 20, there are eight ultra-low freezers at different sites, which can hold up to a million doses at any given point in time. 
There are four chillers for two to eight, giving us a capacity of about just under 400,000. There are four ultra-low freezers. For example, the Pfizer vaccine will be stored at minus 70, which will give us a capacity of storage of 450,000 doses. Additionally, identified designated COVID-19 vaccine sites currently have the capacity to store two to eight. So at all our health centers, we would have additional capacity to store two to eight. Most of our vaccines that we distribute through the EPI program are stored at two to eight, and we can accommodate additional supplies at those places. Next slide. So in terms of our storage plan, stored at the designated vaccination site, and of course, appropriate temperature must be maintained. We look at look charting those temperatures and looking at them continuously. Some of our refrigerators have alarms to go off. If there's excursions of the temperature, the temperature goes above the range that it's supposed to be stored at. And the location is secured by way of access to ensure there's no theft at those, at those points in time. Storage and usage based on the expiry dates. Again, with the initial AstraZeneca, we're looking at an upward limit of six months. If we include from the point of delivery, it may take us down to anywhere between four and five months when we actually get the vaccine. So they need to be used fairly quickly. Vaccine refrigerator temperature are usually recharted twice a day and standardized across the system. Next slide. So the initial distribution of vaccines will occur throughout the country. Initial distribution will be facilitated via the RHAs at various sites and the distribution of the vaccines to the designated vaccine sites will be done via two established pathways, which is the EPI delivery system, expanded program for immunization, as well as the district health visitors who are accustomed to transporting vaccines to and from various sites. Next slide. Again, just to highlight our phase one and phase two, this is a broad reference. It's, it's not um, broken out at this point. Healthcare workers, those over 60 and those with NCDs will form our main part of uh, phase one. Essential workers belong to a broader category of really phase two and mass vaccination of persons all over 18. Remembering at this point, WHO doesn't, has not approved the use of this, these vaccines under the age of 18. And as well in Trinidad, we're not going to give it to pregnant women and breastfeeding women at this time. Next slide. So the administration, the, the Ministry of Health is advanced in its preparation to receive. Necessary consumables for vaccination have already been stockpiled in significant quantities. For example, there's 1 million alcohol swabs and 1.5 million syringes. Of course, if we don't get any syringes and we have vaccines, we can't deliver it into the arm of the, the patients that need them. Health visitors and registered nurses are being trained by EPI in the storage, handling and administration of the vaccine and of course retraining where necessary. COVID-19 vaccination, again, is not mandatory. So in terms of our public-private private partnership, the Ministry recognizes that there's a necessity for public-private partnership in terms of uh, possible distribution via two pa parallel pathways, the first managed directly by the public health sector and the second managed by the private sector with oversight by the Ministry of Health. 23 public health facilities are identified and we're in the process of actually doing a checklist um, to narrow down those, those facilities, making sure that they meet the criteria to go forward. So yeah, 23 were identified when I first did the presentation. We're probably down to 20 at this time. By the end of this week, we will continue our site visits, ensuring that they meet the criteria set out by the ministry to be able to function and then the Honorable Minister will guide as to the suitability of these sites later on in the week. Next slide. Monitoring and evaluation, and, and the importance of this slide basically is to let you know that we have an in-house IT-based system which is actually being used for those 440 patients at present. So we can actually see where they are being administered the doses and there's some analysis of the trends that occur telling us which site has given the doses and there's live uptake and input of the data into the system as people are being vaccinated. Data entry clerks will be assigned to those health centers that are distributing the vaccine for this sole purpose, as well as two registered nurses. And the benefits of the ICT system will be a database for patients, vaccine uptake and inventory management, increased accountability, reduction of wastage, ensuring TEF reduction. Our um, telemedicine program, which was established in March or April of, of 2020, to deal with COVID-19 in terms of cases will also be used 
to call in patients for their second dose and follow them up with their adverse reactions in the meantime while we fully establish our ICT platform. Uh, Candice, that's my update for this morning. Thank you very much, CMO. And as we continue to encourage vaccine acceptance, we go to Dr. Don Martin, who will explain the difference between an adverse event and a side effect after receipt of a vaccine. And you will recall that Dr. Martin was one of our first persons in the country to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. We go to Dr. Martin. Good morning. Thank you, Candice. Um, Honorable Minister, CMO, members of the media and the general public, a pleasant good morning. Um, can I have my first slide, please? So this morning, I'm just going to discuss um, briefly what are vaccination side effects. So by definition, a vaccination side effect is any health problem shown by studies to be caused by a vaccine. So normally before vaccines come to the public, they have to go through a rigorous trial process. So during that process, many side effects may be identified. And based on safety protocols, um, those would, would tend to be considered mild. And um, also, based on the studies, we could have a level of predictability in terms of how often some of these um, side effects may be seen. Common side effects associated with vaccines include pain, swelling, or redness at the injection site, mild fever, some persons may have chills or ague, feeling tired, feeling um, dizzy, muscle aches, joint pains, and headaches. Next slide. Many times, um, side effects may be confused with adverse events. And not only do vaccines have adverse events, also any pharmaceutical product can also have potential adverse events. What is an adverse event? Um, an adverse event is a medical incident that takes place after a vaccination, which causes concern. So people um, f um, get very concerned when these reactions do occur and it's deemed to be caused by the vaccination itself. These events are either individual reactions, and when I say individual reactions, it means that every person's immune system is distinctly different, and we cannot predict who may react to a particular pharmaceutical product. So persons could react to the direct effect of the vaccine itself or one of the components there within. Adverse events may be any unf unfavorable or unintended sign, abnormal laboratory finding, symptom, or disease. However, it's important to note that any untoward or abnormal medical occurrence which occurs following any vaccination, even though it may not be necessarily directly related to the vaccine, can also be documented as an adverse event. So many may have seen in the, in the literature that there may be different conditions that may be possibly related, but we don't have conclusive evidence in many of these areas, whether it's a direct relation or potentially a coincidence. The importance is that these adverse events tend to be quite rare and tend to be unpredictable. A common example is an allergic reaction, even to acetaminophen, um, commonly Panadol or even Ibuprofen, we cannot predict who may be potentially at risk of having an abnormal outcome. I could tell you of my own experience of the side effects that would have been mentioned. I would have had just some local injection site irritation. I would have felt a bit of fatigue the following day, but outside of that, nothing else to mention. But I can also relate that some of my colleagues would have had uh, more distinct symptoms, including fevers and chills, some may have had some local swelling at the site, but it's important to note that these side effects are quite temporary, many of which um, would wane after about 24 to 48 hours, and um, it's much better than actually getting the full-fledged disease. This is just our way of training the immune system, and this reaction is actually the immune system ramping in and saying it's recognizing this foreign product and that it needs to find a way to fight off. Um, which is um, the COVID-19. The COVID, um, Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin. And we go now to a statement from the Prime Minister, Dr. The Honorable Keith Rowley. Good morning, members of the health team. Good morning, Dr. Parashram and your team. Good morning, uh, uh, viewing public. I thought I would join this press conference today because we are at that stage in our response 
with the vaccine, its availability or lack thereof is beginning to be the problem. I don't know um, how much attention you all have been paying to the fact that last week we did have some major interventions from Trinidad and Tobago on this subject of vaccine avail availability. It involved um, me in my capacity, not only as Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, but as Chairman of CARICOM. And may I digress a bit to say that this week can be loosely viewed as CARICOM week, because this is the week when the heads are meeting in our programmed sessional meeting which will take place on Wednesday and, Thursday, Wednesday and Thursday. And I chair those meetings. As I speak to you now, there should be a meeting going on um, which involves two of our ministers, Minister of Trade and Minister of Caricom Affairs, with our Ambassador of Caricom Affairs involved, where we are dealing with a presentation from the Prime Minister of Barbados, who was tasked to um, drive the CSME issues that is taking place right now. So the week is pretty much reserved for CARICOM. But I want to take you back to two things. One is a very, a very troublesome statement that was made this morning by a member of parliament in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Dr. Sicharan of Karani East, who was quoted this morning as saying that the CARICOM, the CARICOM people have got their vaccines and have rolled out their vaccination program. And it's only Trinidad and Tobago who is not able to do that because we have been delinquent and tardy in putting requests to India where vaccines were available and so on. What was worrisome about this, and especially since Trinidad and Tobago is chairing CARICOM, is that this kind of statement is not only wrong, misleading and damaging, but it could really, um, cause the population of Trinidad and Tobago to be more stressed about this vaccination relief that we are looking for. He also then went on to say, very worrisome to me, that if the Prime Minister does not want the vaccines from India, we want our vaccine. Again, I take that for what it is, a statement that has a purpose. Let me tell you why I went into the meeting last week and took part in the WHO press conference and expressed the CARICOM and Trinidad and Tobago's views very strongly with respect to the world market supply availability and behavior of countries with respect to the availability of vaccines for um, countries like ours. And CARICOM represents a group of countries that uh, is being disadvantaged. We are the heads of government meeting of CARICOM early in January. And a statement was issued from that meeting with respect to our concerns about what was happening with, with respect to vaccine availability at that time in early January. CARICOM had to issue a statement. And the reason for that is because what we as a people and as countries of the world had thought was a plan that was in place to allow the vaccine availability and distribution once vaccines became authorized for use, that those plans were failing. And the program that we had put in place, the COVAX, where countries like ours were placing our faith on the WHO that they were, there was trouble ahead. Under the COVAX, the arrangement was that all countries who had agreed to sign on, and most of the countries, 100 and odd countries in the world signed on, agreed to an arrangement where we would all pay up front towards vaccine research so that the universities and the companies that are able to research and develop a vaccine in as quick a time as possible, when that development came to pass, 
and approval was given by the World Health Organization that all of us would, by a formula that we had worked out, be able to access initially a certain quantum of vaccine in relation to our population size. Trinidad and Tobago was very much involved in that and we paid our monies and we were there waiting and you would have heard on many occasions in this press conference that the Minister of Health and the CMO talk to this COVAX thing. But by January, when some confirmations were had that some vaccines were approved, what was happening was that the path towards accessing vaccines for countries like ours was not clear or was not there at all. Bear in mind that vaccines are not like vaccines for COVID-19 and not like other medical supplies which you can buy off the shelf from manufacturers. This was a product which was only available as it was approved by WHO in recent weeks and then had to be produced by the manufacturer who got the approval. And I take you, I take you now to the 18th of January this year to a statement from CARICOM, and I'll read it for you in its current form and you'll understand the nature of the problem that we, would, we are dealing with. This document dated the 18th of January, coming out of CARICOM, item one, it will be recalled that in June 2020, an arrangement was brokered with the African Union for CARICOM member states so desiring to access the African Medical Supplies Platform, the AMSP, to purchase certified medical equipment such as diagnostic and uh, kit protection and so on. And this was done for cost effectiveness and transparency. The Caribbean community set about to get um, to access the COVID-19 vaccines from the AMSP separate and apart from the COVID COVAX facility. So while we were in the COVAX, as I just mentioned, we were also into this program with the African Medical Supplies of the African Union to get vaccines when vaccines became available. I'll come back to that. And it went on to say, CARICOM Secretariat had been advised that one, vaccines will become available for procurement as of Monday, the 18th of January, 2021, for delivery as of March to April, 2021. Price will be the same as for the COVAX facility. And countries with a population of under 1 million may be able to procure their full requirements meaning that those in over a million, like Trinidad and Tobago and others, we will get a portion of our program. And funding may be available through the five-year facility of the African Exim Bank. This, you will understand, is the CARICOM initiative. And the reason for CARICOM being so involved here is because what we were experiencing at the level of the leadership of countries is that if you were a small purchaser, you were not even listened to or entertained by the suppliers who were out there under the control of the bigger, more powerful countries. So outside of COVAX, there was virtually no supply available to small countries like us. However, our diplomatic contact with the African Union being a large block of large countries with large populations, and they were being treated seriously by the suppliers and they had a pathway to purchase vaccines, they agreed with us and agreed to assist us that when they get their large block, they would look out for CARICOM and make vaccines available to CARICOM. So we had to tell them how much we needed. And as I speak to you now, we have to pay based on that confirmation to get from their stores when they get, because virtually nobody is talking to small countries to provide them with vaccines. Now, it's against that background that a statement in Trinidad and Tobago by a member of parliament that CARICOM countries have rolled out their supplies and are vaccinating their nation, but Trinidad and Tobago has not. What is the fact? The fact is that there was a major outbreak in quiet Barbados a few weeks ago. Barbados was going along very quietly and in fact was being held up as a model for how to handle it 
because they were the economy was going along largely undisrupted while COVID was still a threat and Barbados was going along. Next thing we knew, there was an explosion in Barbados, which was centered on Barbados's prison and police. That created a national security problem for Barbados. In that scenario, against the background of what I've just mentioned here for CARICOM, where Barbados was apart, Barbados went one step further in the face of its looming calamity with its uh, prison and police and did ask a number of uh, the large countries whether they could help with an instant supply of vaccine to treat with the explosion. They, have, they approached three countries. One, India, agreed to send an emergency supply to Barbados of 100,000 doses that could in fact deal with 50,000 people. And that is how Barbados got 50,000 um, uh, 100,000 vaccines. And Dominica, having had a serious crisis in recent past, was also seen as a country that required some attention, and India also gave Dominica some vaccines. Those were the two countries under those circumstances that got vaccines as a gift from India. There was no pathway opened to go and get gifts by asking for it. When Barbados got those vaccines, as is normal, the Prime Minister and Barbados, of Barbados and myself, along, along with my other colleagues, the Prime Minister of Barbados and myself, who we are always in communication, she told me she had got those 50,000 and those 100,000 doses for the number of persons, 50,000 persons, because it's two, vac two doses per person. She said, but I will make available to you in Trinidad 2,000, and I will make available to Guyana 2,000. That is how the 2000 got into Trinidad, and I was told that a similar arrangement got into Guyana. In the meantime, because of the nature of the international market and the behavior of the suppliers and others who are seeking to get involved in this distribution for profit and for disadvantaging other people for their own benefit, some countries were looking to Russia where there were vaccines that may be available, but not certified by WHO. Some were looking to Cuba, where a similar situation existed, and some were looking to China. However, it was the position, and it is the position of the government of Trinidad and Tobago, that while we acknowledge that vaccines can be made anywhere in the world, we have to be careful what vaccines we bring into this country. And to protect the people of Trinidad and Tobago, what our policy is, that we will only uh, order, buy, and bring into this country vaccines that have been approved by the WHO. So therefore, the Russian vaccine, which some of our CARICOM colleagues are looking at but have not got any from, the Chinese vaccine that some of us are looking at but have not got any from, the Cuban vaccines, until they are certified by the WHO, they are not available to be used by our populations. However, as you would have seen with the AstraZeneca and the Moderna vaccine, the WHO working with these suppliers indicate when they are likely to approve and when they have approved. To date, we here in Trinidad and Tobago, when we received the gifts of the vaccine from India, as supplied by the Prime Minister of Barbados from her emergency stock that she got from India, we, like Barbados, we accepted the vaccines and we were expecting approval from one of the two Indian sources imminently. We did not put those vaccines out into people's arms until they were certified by WHO. And that was done last week, Monday, the 15th of January. When that happened, India now became a source and a place where a company exists where you could place orders. If placing order means that you are in line to get vaccines, that is still not confirmed because the orders have not yet even been confirmed by the supplier. Because what is happening is that because of the limited supply of vaccines available to the world and being produced only in two or three large powerful countries, small countries are not even being allowed through the door to place the order. It is wrong to say that CARICOM countries have received their vaccines and are, and are vaccinating their population. That is not happening. As I speak to you now, Barbados and, and Bahamas, where Bahamas had a big outbreak not too long ago, 
They are in a bilateral with one of the suppliers. We in Trinidad and Tobago, we are also seeking for bilaterals and placing orders where there are approved vaccines. We have not attempted to place any order in places like Russia and China, but we are waiting to see whether any of those vaccines will make the list of availability going forward. So it is not in, in the COVAX, in, in the African effort, I can tell you that the countries that are alongside us in trying to get a second supply outside of the COVAX, we have Barbados, Belize, Bermuda, Guyana, Jamaica, St. Kitts Nevis, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and Trinidad and Tobago. We are operating as a CARICOM group with the African group to try to tap into their supplies. Because it appears as though what is happening now is that if your order is a small order, you have no place in the line at this time. If you are in a position to place a large order, then you may have that access. We are, through CARICOM, waiting and proceeding and processing an arrangement to get a second line of uh, vaccines from this African medical supply route. Our, our COVAX arrangement is still in place, but you would have seen the Secretary General of the United Nations last week saying that the way it is going, the distribution of these vaccines and the behavior of some of the countries and those countries that are producing and using vaccines within their borders, that they are not acting in solidarity with the rest of the world nations. And the Secretary General of the United Nations intervened last week and made a statement on this matter. On Thursday of last week, you had the WHO Director General making an even more informed and passionate statement saying that the bilateral arrangement that is taking place between those with vaccines and those without vaccines and those with money and those without money, that that bilateral arrangement threatens to undermine the fight of the virus because to try to vaccinate only those who have the power to access the virus against the presence, the, the, the access to those who don't have that power could undermine the effort. And he spoke about vaccine for people everywhere, where everywhere means everybody. Those two interventions from those two offices, the United Nations General, the Secretary General, and the WHO Director General should indicate to any informed person that there is a major problem with respect to the marketplace for these vaccines. What we have to be careful with as a country, Trinidad and Tobago, is not to fall into the hands of charlatans who may come to you and attempt to tell you they could get vaccines for you because they know Mr. X and they know Mr. Y in India or they know Mr. Y in Bombay or in New York or in or Toronto and go down that road and find that you are taken where you pay money in an order and can't receive the product or worse, that you buy a product which is not authorized and create serious legal and other difficulties for misuse of a medical product. So the environment today is very topsy-turvy. The world is behaving the way it has always behaved, where who have corn feed their fowls and who have more corn feed more fowl. That is what we have been fighting. And in this fight, last week, the, the, the United Nations, the WHO and CARICOM have stood before the world objecting to what is happening with the hope that we will be listened to and that there will be changes. I dare say some changes have been indicated and it appears as though there will be some opening because you would have heard the United States government saying that by July, they would have got from their suppliers all the vaccine they need for their entire population. What that means is that what is being produced now is largely being kept at home. And until they have satisfied themselves, the market, the open market, from the major producers with the capacity to produce will not be available to small countries. That is why we are hoping that the people who have, are con, uh, committed to support the COVAX and for whom we paid the money into the COVAX to receive vaccines, that the deadlines that we are looking at in March to begin to receive the COVAX supplies will be our first major uh, receipt 
if we disregard the 2000 that came from Barbados as a gift from an emergency supply, our main supply of, COVID, of vaccines would begin to come to us, provided the COVAX entities receive vaccines from the major suppliers. I'll tell you something else too. In following up on what we did last week, Thursday, in addressing this matter frontally, a publication came out from National Public Radio in the United States, pointing out what was um, put out by WHO and CARICOM last week. They did, the, they did the investigation to see who was paying what for vaccines. The COVAX vaccines are approximately um, for, for, for 95 US per vaccine, per dose. Um, that publication from the United States showed that the range of prices, uh, India, 272, in India, where the bulk of the vaccine is manufactured by one of the main manufacturers. And in, the United, in Europe, they were paying about 325 US for a, for a dose. And by the time you get to Uganda, where they have the same difficulty we're having now, but the price for a dose is 850. And I could tell you, there are people hanging around us here in Trinidad and Tobago, some nationals of Trinidad and Tobago, and some of them in the medical fraternity, seeking to assist, quote unquote, us with vaccine. And they're quoting prices to us, thinking that we are in desperation, prices in the order of $19 and $25 a dose. Well, certainly, that should tell you how careful the government has to be in treating with this requirement to obtain vaccines, but ensuring that we follow a policy in getting vaccines, not only from certified sources, but from authorized persons who are authorized to act on behalf of those who are manufacturing the vaccine. I know of one instance where a local agent of one of the major manufacturers of this vaccine has advanced himself as an agent for the company and sought to get contracts here in Trinidad to be able to supply that vaccine the local agent would have communicated with its foreign um, superior only to be told, call the police. That person is no part of our business and therefore is a fraudster. So we have to be careful on those counts that we get good vaccines, certified vaccines, and that we are not taken by charlatans. So I want today to tell the member of parliament for Karani East to please assist us in this international fight, assist us in this local fight. And with Trinidad and Tobago chairing CARICOM, I ask the population to get your information and accept your information only from authorized official sources. I don't want to um, censor you in the receipt of your information. I want to protect you from misinformation. And with respect to the doctor from Karani East saying that the prime minister doesn't want to take vaccine from India, and we want to be vaccine. That is a dog whistle that we can do without. We, a lot of our current medication outside of COVID-19 comes from India. Everybody knows that there's a major manufacturer of medication and sold to the world. There is no issue and no requirement here to raise, to raise any racial bogey and try to stereotype anybody. We are all in this fight together. And from our CMO to our Minister of Health, to our Prime Minister, to our Chairman of CARICOM, to the WHO and the United Nations, we are all on the same page in trying to access vaccines, which are in tremendous demand around the world and serious short supplies. And it appears as though um, we, in, the, in, the, in the coming months, this situation will continue. But when more vaccines become available by more manufacturers being certified or large volumes being produced from the factories, or that the key countries have satisfied their population, this situation will not ease in the next few weeks or so. I tell you this this morning, so that each and every one of you, right thinking, intelligent people will understand that this is not simply a matter of going out there and saying, I want this, so I want that, and I can have it, and I have a check, I can pay for it. Even when you can pay for it, you can't get it. And therefore, as we, we, are, we are waiting, that so that um, the COVAX supply should come to us um, in, a, in a few weeks. Uh, another issue that arose here recently was why didn't the prime minister take the vaccine? 
It had nothing to do with my acceptance of vaccination or the vaccine or fear of the vaccine. I had said that I would be the first to take it so as to demonstrate that I'm not afraid of it and that it should not be feared. However, given the small number that we got and got it as a gift from Barbados, which was intended actually for public officials in public administration, I took the decision that I'd rather have a nurse or a doctor or any caregiver in any one of our hospitals have that vaccine while I wait for mine. And I was told by the minister that we are anticipating the arrival of our first shipment um, sometime in the middle of March. So I wait for that. And of course, you would have heard from Dr. Parasham this morning exactly how prepared we are to receive vaccines of the various types when they become available. It is not a situation under our control. It just happens that we are in a position to be speaking not only for Trinidad and Tobago, but for the region and I dare say for the world. Small island development states, we speak for them from CARICOM and from Trinidad and Tobago. And I really would like the support of my colleagues in the parliament on this rather than attempt to undermine our effort. Thank you very much. And I leave you in the hands, capable hands of our medical personnel to carry on this press conference. I thank you. Thank you very much to the Honorable Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Rowley, for joining us today. And we go now into the question and answer segment. We remind our media representatives to state their names and the names of the media houses that they represent before posing their questions. Please, a reminder, two brief questions per media house in the first instance. And if we have additional time, we will try to facilitate additional questions. We go now to... CNC3, please. Hi, good morning, everyone. Rashad Khan, Guardian Media Limited. Okay, so my first question, I don't know if the Prime Minister himself would take this or the health officials, but I, I, I seem to be a little bit confused about something, right? Um, Dr. Rowley, when you were speaking there just now, you gave the impression that some of these manufacturers and um, companies, vaccine companies, aren't really entertaining small states. But since last year, we've been hearing that we've been in bilateral talks with some of these companies, about five or six of these companies. So I, I just want a little bit more clarification on this disparity. Is it a case that we are talking to them, but they are not talking with us? Um, my second question is, I saw that we have, um, we, 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 we allowed outdoor sporting activities to take place. Now, I'm not sure if things like hiking or off-roading, all those different things are popular locations for many of these activities are by around rivers and streams and that sort of things, because a lot of people try to be healthy, take a hike to a river or whatever. Would that be allowed or is that still captured under the regulation that prohibits that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rashad. So let me try and um, take part one and the CMO could probably take part two about hiking and so on. Yes. So we have, as we have stated, been in bilateral talks. So as the Honorable Prime Minister would have said, let me give you some of the numbers that are that we discuss. Some companies will not talk to you unless you could buy three million doses. There is no way Trinidad and Tobago even needs three million doses, can store three million doses, or pay for three million doses at the same time. And that is what is going on. Um, let me just alert the national community what we have to be careful with. You will hear people saying that we have offered vaccines to Trinidad and Tobago. Your offers come to me. And very often when I investigate the vendors, I then pass on the name and addresses and phone contacts of these vendors to the authorized local agents who then pass it on to their international security partners um, based in their head offices. There is a lot of fake vaccines out there. Um, there was a recent Time article, I'm not going to call the country's name, but you can research it. There was a recent Time article in the magazine Time which spoke to a country actually using, unknowingly, fake vaccines. So we have to be very careful, and that is why we have been prudent in saying from day one, we will only use vaccines authorized by WHO. And AstraZeneca fortunately got that authorization last week, Monday. So that is where we are with some bilateral talks, um, but we continue bilateral talks and hopefully we can reach some agreement 
CMO if you yeah. could deal with the other issue. So, so sporting, sporting activity, the, the regulation was meant to allow for persons to have recreational activities um, in a savanna or those sorts of places. It, with regards to the rivers and streams question, um, that regulation still remains in force as far as I'm aware. So the rivers and streams, any activity related to those will still be um, something that is restricted by the regulation. But it really is meant for recreational purposes within savannas, those kinds of gatherings, and of course the stipulated number that goes along with that. All the other regulations remain in force, including the mask, mandatory mask wearing regulation or mandatory face covering regulation allowing for mask wearing, shield wearing, or anything that covers from your nose all the way down to your chin in terms of the regulation. And, and just to clarify, I'm, I'm glad Richard raised um, the question and CMO touched on it, but I want to make an emphatic statement. The allowance for recreational sports, you have to have a face covering. Somebody asked me, well, what if I'm trying to break a time? like running. This is for recreational sport, not for professional sport. Go out there, exercise as much as you want, play as much as you want. It's good for your physical health, it's good for your mental health, but you must have a face covering, a mask or a shield on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. And we go now to Newsday newspaper, please. Hi, good morning, Ryan. Hi, good morning, Mr. Davis. We seem to have lost audio. Okay, while we sort that out, hello, we will... good oh, good. We can hear you. Please continue, sir. Yeah, hello, good. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, the first question I want to ask uh, this goes to the chief medical officer. Um, are there any are there any of the medical uh, uh, the frontline workers who have decided not to take the vaccine? Um, now, and what, what is the prevalence of that, if there, if there is any? And to the Minister of Health, uh, Minister Dial Singh, as far as, as far as what I understand, there is no an opportunity for, for Trinidad and Tobago to look into what could be, um, what could be taken from India, seeing as they have this health facility available. Will the ministry be looking into taking um, um, vaccines from India now that the AstraZeneca has been approved? Okay, so the, the position of the Trinidad and Tobago government from day one under COVAX with AstraZeneca was always to accept vaccines made in India under the auspices of the Serum Institute of India because what WHO, it authorizes not only the vaccine but the manufacturing plant. So that has always been our intention. It's just that there are some people in society, as the Honorable Prime Minister said, who have a different agenda. It has always been the intention under COVAX to accept vaccines from the Serum Institute of India. I am told by WHO PAHO that the doses that we are getting, the 100 to 120,000 doses, will come from two authorized plants, Serum Institute of India and one in South Korea. Okay, so that has always been the plan, contrary to what other disruptive people in society are trying to paint us as. Thank you. Right. In, in terms of the numbers um, so far, so when I had asked the Southwest Regional Health Authority, for example, out of the first thousand persons that we want to vaccinate, we want to do the, the highest risk of the healthcare workers. So those persons that would actually be seeing COVID-19 cases on a daily basis, those persons would be offered the vaccine first. So the institutions we had chosen for that is Augustus Long Hospital in San Fernando, Arima General Hospital, Cora, as well as Coover Hospital and Multi-Training Facility in Trinidad, and the Scarborough General Hospital, parts of that dedicated for COVID-19 in Tobago. So just to give you an example, we, I would have asked for a number of persons within the Augustus Long Hospital from the CEO. He gave me a number of 196 persons that would have met that criteria. Out of those individuals, 113 persons would have taken wow. it in one day. Um, of course, there would be persons that may be pregnant or breastfeeding that can't have it within that cohort, but the uptake has been very good. Out of the Cora, Coover, cohort, I think we're looking at 400 to 500 persons that fall within the group, and already they have close to 300 persons vaccinated. 
So it has been the uptake in that high high risk group has been very good so far. Tobago has just started out on Saturday, but they have indicated that it's going very well and there hasn't been people are coming forward to have their vaccines. Thank you very much, CMO. That's some very encouraging news for all of us in the public. Vaccine acceptance. And we go now to AZP News, please. Hi, good morning. Priya Bihari, azpnews.com. Um, I just want to find out how many frontline healthcare workers we have in the country and, and how many healthcare workers we have. And that's my first question. And second question, um, um, CMO, uh, have you taken the vaccine yet? And, and if not, when? When would you take the vaccine? Thank okay. you. Oh, okay, Priya. So I will um, answer the first questions. In the total health ecosystem, there are approximately 17,000 workers. That includes doctors, nurses, frontline staff, administrative staff. So we all have already identified frontline healthcare workers are approximately 5,000, but not all 5,000 have the same risk of being exposed. That is why we stratified it and said we will vaccinate using this 2,000 our healthcare workers at the COVID facilities who have the highest risk, which is um, Arima, Cora, Coover, and Augustus Long. So that um, that first 2,000 doses, which can vaccinate 1,000 persons, are dedicated to those of the highest of the high risk, the most front line of the front, front line. So those are your two answers prior. Thank okay. you very much. Can. And we go to CMO. So, so yeah, just following on Minister's comment. So we don't want to take any vaccine away from people that see COVID-19 cases every single day. Dr. Martin is the chief of staff of Coover Hospital, for example. He would be in the hot zone as we call it, on a daily basis. Therefore, his risk is, is much higher than my personal risk of contracting COVID-19. And we really want to make sure that our healthcare workers who are on the front line of this fight get the first vaccines in the country. As soon as the additional doses come from uh, our first COVAX batch, I am, I am assuring you that I will have my first vaccine at that point in time, but not with this first thousand. Yeah, and as we've been saying since last week prior, both the Prime Minister said it, I said it, and the CMO said it. Because we only got 2,000, we do not want to take away even one dose from this precious lot of 2,000. We prefer if all of this 2,000 doses go to our frontline people in the first instance. I assure you, and we will say it again, from Prime Minister come down when he just said it, I and the CMO, we will take it from the second batch uh, where we could vaccinate 50 to 60,000 persons. Thank you, Minister. And we're just going up to Dr. Martin um, to give us some feedback as a person who's high risk and high exposure, what it means for him and his colleagues to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Hi, um, I think it's um, the best um, ammunition that we have in terms of mitigating the spread of COVID-19. Um, as I've said before, um, taking the vaccine primes our immune system and betters us for the fight against the, the virus, which is COVID-19. Um, when it comes to healthcare workers, we are on the front lines, as has been mentioned, and we come face to face. We um, integrate or we interface with patients who are high risk. We do procedures that put us at specifically high risk. So it's actually quite, quite um, pivotal that we protect ourselves and that we make sure that our immune systems are thoroughly intact or have the capabilities to fight the scourge of COVID-19. So I think it's highly important for our precious commodity in terms of our healthcare workers to be protected as our first line of defense and as the warriors in the fight against COVID-19. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin. We go now to Wired 868. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Fayola Bostic from Wired 868. Um, my first question is for the health minister. Um, we spoke, well, the prime minister just spoke about, you know, the issues that we're having with, with um, supply. So I'm just wondering, um, as far as the 100,000 or the 100 to 120 that we're expecting from COVAX to the COVAX facility, if we have any idea of where those vaccines are right now, so have they been manufactured? Are they on their way? 
do we have any clue as to, you know, can we track where they are and how close they are to us? That's my first question. Um, my second question is I'm wondering uh, about the ICT pro platform that the CMO spoke about. Is that going to be used um, when you are looking at vaccinating NCD patients who are not going through state facilities? So, for example, NCD patients who are within the private sector, are they going to make appointments through um, the ICT platform or how will they be able to sign up to get their vaccine? Okay, thank you very much. So, let me um, let's explain how the COVAX facility works and how the manufacturing works. The vaccine manufacturers don't necessarily wait until WHO signs off. So, for instance, the 2,000 doses that came in via Barbados would have already been manufactured prior to February 15th. That is done so that once approval is given, you have vaccines already manufactured on a shelf and is ruled out. So when we get our 100 and 120,000 doses, this will be vaccines already manufactured from two plants, as we indicated, Serum Institute of India and another plant in South Korea. The chief medical officer, when he gave his presentation at the start, gave you the whole process of how vaccines reach here. As of now, we don't have an airway bill number. We don't have a consignment number. As soon as we have those, I know people are anxious, but there is a process to follow. It is the information coming out of PAHO WHO that between tomorrow and the next couple of days, as I said in the Parliament in answer to a question on Friday, we will get more information as they roll out the um, delivery of vaccines to countries under the COVAX facility. And we hope to have that information within the next few days. But vaccines have already been manufactured, like the AstraZeneca, have been approved as of last week, um, Monday. And then we wait over the next couple of days to hear from COVAX and WHO when we'll be receiving our tranche of the 120,000 vaccines. So I hope that answers your question and pass you on to the C CMO. Yeah. So the ICT platform is really meant to track everyone that actually has the vaccine, both by way of having a, a, a data set in terms of numbers of persons that would have received it. We will also track if you have any adverse reactions to those vaccines, and it will also be a prompt as to when you need to come in for your second dose of the vaccine. When we complete our look at the 20 vaccination sites later on in the week, and we have a finalized list, that will be shared with the population with regards to your patients outside of the public sector. Persons can walk in, as I said, to those one of those 20 centers in your area to have your vaccination done. So we will be accepting some degree of walk-in as well as generating parallel sites eventually so that you can have other sites outside of the health centers to walk into. But we will communicate um, with the national population once we confirm the sites, the days of the week people can walk in, the days of the weeks that we have, for example, NCD clients attending and, and let persons know how they can actually come into the uh, facilities to get their vaccines. Thank you, CMO. And we have limited time, so we really want to get the questions to be brief and to the point. We go to Express, please. Good morning, Kim Bojong from the Express. Uh, I hope this is not something we missed, but uh, can either the minister or the CMO tell us, on, on average, what is it, the contribution to the numbers of, of daily or monthly positives now of repatriated uh, people, people coming in? Um, also, I will try not to ramble. The minister De Alsing, can you would you tell us then, and with great sensitivity towards not creating any sort of panic or increasing the anxiety in the population about the vaccine. We see there are specific avenues, but we hear the prime minister saying the world is behaving as it should. So, I mean, would you tell us your, your level of confidence that we will acquire what we need at least closely within the time that we need it? And without making it three questions, how, how does this update, for instance, our situation in terms of rolling back some of the restrictions we're still um, coping with now. Thanks, I hope that was clear. Okay, so I'll take your last question. We rolled back 
we roll back some um, some activities on Saturday. As you know, at time is of the essence. Um, outdoor recreational sports. So we did that on to and started today. And you must wear masks. Two, we are working via three or four channels, as the Prime Minister said, and I have been saying, COVAX, bilateral, CARICOM initiatives, other initiatives to get vaccines into the country. We are hoping that the advocacy by the United Nations General Secretary and Dr. Tedros brings some sanity to make sure that small countries like us can access our fair share of vaccines. Thank you, Kim. With regards to the repatriation question, um, our numbers are low. Our, our rolling average for seven days is five, uh, five cases. So out of that, we have seen a similarly low number of repatriates coming back as positive, I think, since the introduction of the 72-hour PCR. So those numbers are very small as well, one or two persons sometimes per an entire group of persons that come back. So that, that sort of number. Thank you very much, CMO. And now TV6, please. Hi, good morning. Alicia Boucher. Good afternoon, sorry. Alicia Boucher from TV6 here. Um, Minister, both you and the Prime Minister mentioned, you know, suspicious persons coming to you um, in terms of offering the country vaccines. How prevalent is that? That's the first question. The second question is, I know that um, sometime during this process, you would have mentioned that persons in the private sector may be able to acquire vaccines. Um, given what you are seeing in terms of fake vaccinations, the price um, hikes on vaccines, should we at this point be concerned in terms of that aspect and would measures be put in place to ensure how the private sector, if we're discussing that at this time, acquire vaccines? Thank you, Alicia. Two, two really deep uh, questions. So how prevalent is this thing about charlatans with vaccines? It is very, very prevalent. And what I do, as soon as it comes to me, I inform the Honorable Pri Prime Minister so he knows his Minister of Health is not riding off into the sunset um, uh, dealing with charlatans. I also pass on the correspondence to the relevant local distributors who then contact their headquarters and get their international policing efforts on it. I will give this population the promise that I as Minister of Health will not expose this country to charlatans, fake vaccines, unauthorized vaccines. That's one. Two, the private sector, as we have said, if and when the time reaches when the private sector who are entitled to import vaccines once they are authorized and go through the re uh, relevant registration process under the Drug Advisory Committee, they can bring in vaccines. I have already spoken to the Attorney General in the same way that we mandated in the regulations that private sector testing sites could be set up on the condition that they let us know their numbers. I have already spoken to the Attorney General that when that time comes, that local vaccine agents, and I've already spoken to a couple of them and gotten their buy-in, that they will also be mandated to let us know the quantities they are bringing in, who they are distributing to, and those persons have to report to the ministry. The reason being, we want to know if and when we are reaching herd immunity. It's for that purpose only. So there must be a central repository of that data and the same way we did it in the health regulations for private sector testing i have spoken to the attorney general that in the regulations in the future we will have that similar approach so as a country we can manage this thing pro properly and i already have buy-in from a couple of the vaccine distributors who have absolutely no problem with that approach but excellent questions alicia thank you very much Thank you very much, Minister. And just a reminder, please make your questions brief. We go to a follow-up question from CNC3, please. Um, I'm not sure if I missed this, so please correct me if I'm wrong. So when we um, outlined our phases 
and the categories of people that will be getting the vaccine, what is our threshold number when we get these vaccines? Is it that we're going to say, okay, 20,000 go into this category and we'll wait until that 20,000 is distributed and then move on to another category? How is that going to work? Okay, so we have a rough idea of the population of, for example, persons with NCDs based on some lists that we have been getting. So we're looking at about 80,000 people with NCDs. We're looking as well as persons with healthcare workers, roughly 17 to 20,000 in total. So those will be our first front line. And again, persons over 60 are included in, in that list as well. So we have that sort of threshold to know for those three categories who are our first phase, we have an idea of how many, how many people are, are within that group one. It will also depend on how the uptake is within that group. So of course, if it is taking a longer period of time for those persons to be vaccinated in that group, we will continue with our strategy and roll into phase two, but that is to be determined at a later date. And um, we go now, thank you very much, CMO, to Newsday, please. Hi, good day again, Ryan Hamilton Davis. Uh, just to go back to the issue of the fake vaccines, uh, from a medical perspective, what would be the what would be the risks involved, and what will be the health risks um, connected to taking a vaccine that vaccine that is not approved by the WHO and may well may as well be fake? Thank you. Yeah. So, so the reason we have an approval process, and and we will come later on in the week to describe the process it takes to to go from phase one all the way to phase four and then beyond that to get WHO approval. It is really to pre prevent having safe and effective vaccines in the country to ensure that we have safe and effective vaccines. Once you go outside of that process and you have a vaccine, sometimes that is fake. Um, no one can tell what the constituents of that vaccine is. And of course, it is highly considered highly unsafe, highly dangerous to anyone that would take it because we don't know the contents. So we don't know what you're gonna put into your system. It is of course, uh, um, not something just for medicines as as we do treat medicines as fake medicines and there's a program in terms of regulation and enforcement that it goes along with it starting with customs and everyone else there's a similar process in place for vaccines and we will be looking out for for it um, in light of what minister has alluded to fake vaccines circulating in the world that our customs um, department as well as our food and drug department is on the lookout for these types of um, products circulating and of course seizing them and doing the necessary legal aspects if if and when that occurs. Thank you very much and the final question today from AZP News please. Hi good afternoon again. Uh, Minister has any of these um, for charlatans cases been been referred to the police? So this is the international thing. So what we do, we report it to the local distributor who then takes the necessary action. They can either go to the local police or, as I said, refer to the international security part partners. So they are the ones to take the action because you have these people purporting to represent company X, Y, and Z. So they can take it to the local police. Thank you very much, everyone. We have come to the end of today's media conference. Today we were joined by virtually by the Prime Minister, Dr. The Honorable Keith Rowley, and he looked at COVID-19 vaccine availability. Um, also today we provided some additional information about the National COVID-19 rollout plan. And we had with us Dr. Martin, one of our first persons to receive the vaccine, and he spoke on the difference between a side effect and an adverse reaction. We encourage everyone, please continue to do all that you need to do to protect yourself and your loved ones. Stay home if you don't need to go out and please wear your mask.